Welcome to the University of Georgia College of Environment and Design. We're pleased you've joined us this afternoon for the Eleanor Ferguson Vincent Lecture. I'm James Reap, the coordinator of the Historic Preservation Program in the college, and I'll be your moderator today. This lecture was made possible by a fund established by Ms. Odie Vincent in honor of her mother, Eleanor Ferguson Vincent, a prominent Athens resident and a charter member of the Ladies Garden Club of Athens, Georgia, which is celebrating its 130th anniversary this year and recognized as the first garden club in America. Uh, following the lecture today, there'll be a question and answer period. And uh, I'd like to ask you to post any questions or comments in the chat, and I will read as many as time will allow for our speaker to respond. Also, we are, uh, taping this, mess, uh, this lecture today, and it will be available on the College of Environment and Design website if you'd like to review it again. I'm very pleased to introduce a friend and colleague, Tom Mays, the Chief Legal Officer and General Counsel of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Uh, Tom received both his bachelor's and law degrees from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm always amazed at the breadth and depth of Tom's knowledge and experience. Since joining the trust in 1986, he's dealt with a tremendous range of preservation issues, including real estate, historic property management, architectural and technical preservation issues, collection management, preservation easements, covenants, Americans with Disability Act implementation, and even historic shipwrecks, just to name a few. He's written widely and spoken widely on these and related subjects. In addition to his work at the Trust, Tom taught historic preservation law at the University of Maryland graduate program in historic preservation. And in 2013, he received the prestigious National Endowment for the Arts Rome Prize in historic preservation. And during his residency in Rome, wrote a series of essays that form the basis of his book, Why Old Places Matter. Building on that theme, his topic today will be heritage, belonging, and place, addressing the question as to how saving and reusing old places in our communities support a sense of well-being and help us flourish. Tom, it's a pleasure to have you. Welcome. Thank you, James. I'm delighted to be here today uh, virtually. And let me just return the favor briefly and let everyone become aware of how well known you are in the field, James, both nationally and internationally, your work in legal issues across the country and across the world are acknowledged and really well known. So thank you. It's an honor to be introduced by you. Um, I also wanted to thank the College of Environment and Design and also the Eleanor uh, Ferguson Vincent Fund. Uh, it's an honor to present the Ferguson Lecture. And I also want to acknowledge some of the graduates of the preservation program at Georgia who are close colleagues of mine, in particular, the Chief Preservation Officer of the National Trust, Catherine Malone France, who sends her greetings, as does the President of the National Trust, Paul Edmondson. Again, I'm delighted to be here with you all today for this conversation about old places. And what I'd like to do is review some of the key concepts from the book, Why Old Places Matter, and then turn to some more recent writing and some thoughts about why old places have such a profound influence on our mental and emotional well being and our most fundamental needs for beauty, connection, love, and belonging. Throughout, I will also note the relationships between these concepts and the changes that we've all been through in the past year, including the role of preservation in social and racial justice. I'm going to try to bring together some um, divergent themes, and I hope that they will result in a larger whole. So I hope that you'll bear with me as we go through this together. The image that you're seeing on the screen is the Mount, the home of Edith Wharton in Lenox, Massachusetts. I've selected it because the National Trust holds a historic preservation easement on the Mount to ensure its long-term protection, but also because this is a place of beauty and creativity 
and belonging, a place where Edith Wharton wrote and asserted her right to write as a woman, albeit a very privileged one, and it is a place that continues to inspire. As you know, the work I'm gonna talk about today is based on the book, uh, Why Old Places Matter. And I think some background would be helpful. I wanted you to know that I set out to explore this topic because of my experience teaching and writing about historic preservation law, as James mentioned. I would begin every course I taught with a discussion of why we have historic preservation law. And to my surprise, it would turn very quickly into a conversation about why we have historic preservation at all. And I was surprised to discover that many of the students in my class who were graduate students in historic preservation and architecture didn't really have the words and phrases to describe why these old places in our communities and in our lives seem to matter so much to them. People would talk about preserving our heritage and property values and tourism, but these didn't seem to capture the deeply felt passion about these places. So I began to gather the reasons together and to think about them. My idea was to give people the words and phrases to express why old places mattered to them, and hopefully to build a stronger ethic of historic preservation in their communities and in the country, which then I hoped would lead to stronger laws and policies. I'm happy to say that the book seems to be being used for exactly the purposes I had hoped. People have told me that they've bought copies for all of their city council members. Preservation organizations have used the themes to celebrate the old places in their communities. It's been cited in testimony before municipal boards and in legal briefs. And I just learned of one community where every time a new place is landmarked, the owners are given a copy of the book. And it's spurred other conversations and further explorations into these topics, which are really what I hope to share with you today. I'll note that the cover of the book was intentionally chosen uh, because uh, this place, Union Station, here, shown here, uh, in Washington, D.C., represents so many of the ideas in the book. It was, a, it was a project that the National Trust named a national treasure and where we continue to work to preserve its historic character. Ultimately, I wrote around 14 reasons. And the 14 reasons included a wide range from what I consider the most fundamental ideas of continuity, identity, and memory, which I'll come back to, to the fact that old places inspire us with all beauty and sacredness, because they tell us about history, ancestry, and learning, and because they foster healthy, sustainable, economically vibrant communities. Union Station does almost all of these things. It is an actively used train station in the heart of Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. It is a landmark that is part of our national identity that provides us with a sense of continuity with the past, that is used by people every day for eating, drinking, traveling, shopping, or simply gazing, even now with the continuing impacts of the coronavirus. Although Union Station, like Penn Station in New York, was nearly lost, it is now almost impossible to imagine the District of Columbia without it. And we continue to work to sustain and preserve it while also keeping it alive. As I turn to the new directions, I'd like to review four of the concepts from the book that I think are at the heart of why old places matter to people so much. Continuity, memory, and identity, both individual and civic. Let me begin with continuity. Old places give people a sense of continuity. In a world that is constantly changing, old places provide people with a sense of being part of a continuum that is necessary for them to be psychologically and emotionally healthy. Maria Lewicka, an environmental psychologist, says that the majority of authors agree that the development of emotional bonds with places is a prerequisite of psychological balance and good adjustment, and that it helps to overcome identity crises and gives people the sense of stability they need in the ever-changing world. We often see this in the schools and churches in our communities. 
in the upper right is Caldwell Station School in Huntersville, North Carolina, where my father went to school and which remains a community preschool today. Caldwell Station School looks like a Rosenwald school and the National Trust Rosenwald uh, School Program recognizes that these former schools provide that sense of continuity for their communities. But perhaps we see this sense of continuity most forcefully when the continuity between people and place is broken such as here on the left at Palmer Chapel in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, where people who were forcibly removed from their homes continue to return for reunions and gatherings even generations later. This happens all over the world, such as in the lower right in Matera, Italy, where people were forcibly removed from these half cave dwellings for supposedly better housing. The grandmother of a guide there told us that the community was never the same after the displacement. And I would say that the displacement of urban renewal, which broke people's connections to place, continues to have a profound impact on people and communities today. Old places matter because they give people a sense of community, continuity, memory. Old places help us remember. The architect Mary Danaidi tells her granddaughter, old buildings are like memories you can touch. Memory is an essential part of consciousness. Without memory, we are hardly ourselves. We've seen this in how we react to people who have Alzheimer's or other conditions where they lose their memory. Their identity is partially erased. And there is, as the geographers Stephen Holsher and Derek Alderman say, an inextricable link between memory and place. People anchor their divergent memories in place. There are two aspects of memory in place, individual memory. And here I use in the upper left, the example of the Cafe Reggio in New York, which I frequented when I was in my twenties. I continue to return to the Cafe Reggio now to remember the place, but mostly to remember the person I was then and to measure how I have changed since that time. And then there is collective memory, a collective societal sense of memory, such as the memory of the March on Washington. When we see this image of the reflecting pool or virtually any image of the reflecting pool, we are reminded of the March on Washington, even though many of us may not have even been born when the march occurred. Old places serve as mnemonic aids that anchor our memory. Individual identity. Old places embody our identity. People have long recognized the link between place and identity from Cicero, who wrote of returning to his grandfather's house, to James Marston Fitch, who wrote that preservation affords the opportunity for the citizens to regain a sense of identity with their own origins, of which they have often been robbed by the sheer process of urbanization. Virtually everyone who has studied the issue in a wide variety of fields confirms the links between place and identity. There are those who even theorize that identity and place are inseparable, that people are always in and out place, that life itself begins and ends with place. Our sense of identity with place is not static, however. It changes over time. We may form identities with different places. Here in the upper left, I show the church I was raised in, to which my family has long ties, and my great-grandfather's simple white farmhouse in the lower left. But I've also formed attachments with other places, with DuPont Circle, shown in the upper right, and with the American Academy in Rome, shown in the lower right. Old places embody our individual identity. Old places also embody our civic, state, national, and even universal identity. Independence Hall, shown here on the left, and countless other places embody the history and principles of the United States. The preservation movement has long championed these places and patriotism and national identity have been key drivers of the preservation movement, particularly under the Historic Sites Act of 1935. But I noted when I talked to people that we no longer feel very comfortable talking about patriotism as a reason to save old places, a reticence that reflects what Edward Said described as the vexed issue of nationalism 
and national identity of how memories of the past are shaped in accordance with a certain notion of what we, or for that matter, they really are. We have left people out. And when I say we, I mean the preservation community. In, people, enslaved people were not even mentioned at plantation houses. Native Americans were treated as the enemy and countless workers and everyday people were simply not acknowledged. And it's important to know that national identity can be manipulated. In the center is a building in Rome called the Square Colosseum that Mussolini had built specifically to try to tie his regime to Imperial Rome. But the thing about old places that's interesting to me is that the continued presence of old places permits and may even foster the acknowledgement of changed identities and the transformation of identity over time, like the way slavery is now acknowledged at Monticello and Mount Vernon. In fact, at some former plantation sites, slavery has now become the central story, reflecting a change in our understanding of our past and its meaning for the present day. Old places often become the vortex for these discussions, however uncomfortable they may be, such as the Confederate Memorial shown here from my hometown in Cornelius, North Carolina. I can, um, the Confederate Monuments is an entire presentation on its own, but I'll be happy to take questions about that at the end. There are also places, however, that form part of our universal identity, our identity as humans. We felt that when we saw the giant Buddhas at Bamiyan being destroyed. We feel it when we see the pyramids. These are parts of our world that belong to all of us. Old places are part of our ever evolving collective identity. These words and ideas I've shared are only four of the many I wrote about. And I'll note some others in a bit. Yet it seems to me that these ideas are at the heart of why old places matter to people. After writing the book and continuing to study these concepts, I now think that old places are even more fundamentally important to people than I thought they were. Although many decision makers primarily think of preservation as something nice, my explorations into continuity, memory, identity and community, particularly the fields of place attachment and place identity, suggests that continuity of place is much more important to people than we have fully realized. In March 2020, just as the US shut down as a result of the coronavirus, I was to have been in Edinburgh, Scotland to speak at a symposium on emotional attachments to heritage talking about why old places matter. The symposium was bringing together speakers from around the world who were specifically interested in historic preservation and people's emotional attachments, not only to place, but to heritage places specifically. In preparing for the event, I wrote this. When people are emotionally attached to places, the continued existence of these places becomes fundamentally important. In Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the sense of belongingness immediately follows physiological needs of air, food, water, and the need for safety. The old places of our cities and towns and the attachments people feel to those places give people the sense of continuity, memory, and identity that are part of fulfilling that fundamental sense of belonging. As an essential part of fostering a sense of belonging, historic preservation becomes not only something nice to do that enhances people's lives, but a practice that has the potential to be fundamentally necessary for people's emotional and psychological health. The program would have included the people from the British National Trust who produced this report, Places That Make Us, a study of people's connections to place and how they feel about heritage. The report, which is available online, sought to understand the quote, visceral but intangible feeling people have in places that are special to them, as well as the depth of people's connection with place. 
Stating that it was the first piece of research of its kind, the project used functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, to track changes to areas of the brain associated with emotional processing as people looked at images of places and objects. They examined activity in three brain regions, the left amygdala, which is associated with our automatic unconscious processing of emotion, the medial prefrontal cortex, which is associated with emotional appraisal and memory processing, and the parahippocampal place area, which is associated with responses to place. The report concluded that, and I'm quoting here, it is clear that key areas of emotional processing are activated by special places. Firstly, we have seen evidence that the amygdala generates an automatic emotional response to these places. Moreover, we've shown that our feelings are made conscious through the medial prefrontal cortex by accessing memories of the place and appraising the situations associated with that place. Finally, even non-emotional processing areas appear to play an important role, eliciting thoughts about oneself being in this place. The report concluded that, and again, I quote, the findings of this re research show that places are more than a space to visit and enjoy for their aesthetic beauty. In fact, they have long lasting effects that have an impact on us physically and psychologically, and even encourage behavioral responses that have the potential to benefit others. I'll come back to this. The report was followed in 2019 by a report titled, why places matter to people. The March 2019 research finds that those with a connection to historic buildings and gardens were more likely to say they experience feelings of belonging and feeling awestruck when they visit their special place compared with their connections, with, with uh, connections to other outdoor places. The Places That Make Us report was a brain study. It seems to me that neuroscience is one of the most exciting areas of research that may impact preservation. What is the brain science behind the way we experience old places? As a lifelong preservationist, I, like many other old house hunters, have felt the quality of an old place. Even decades later, I can imagine and re-experience the feeling of being in the old ab abandoned shell of a house serving as a barn that I recalled from my childhood in the book. When I remember the tall plastered rooms of that house, it's as if I'm in that weather-worn old place right now, touching the scrolled bracket on the stairway. This is in fact a stair bracket that I believe would have been made by the very same builder in a house in North Carolina that is now preserved through the work of Preservation North Carolina. I regret the loss of that other house used as a barn to this day, but why was the experience so powerful and long lasting? In 2017, the Richard Driehaus Foundation sponsored a symposium titled Architecture as Experience, Human Perception in the Built Environment. Speakers from around the world explored the current science behind how we experience, remember, and respond to architectural spaces, including landscapes and urban design, and the implications for architectural practice, and to some degree for preservation. The most hard science of the presentations was an interview with Dr. Vittorio Galese, professor of neurology at the University of Parma. Dr. Galese explained that we experience architecture and artworks through mirror neurons and embodied simulation. As Dr. Galese describes it, when we see a phone sitting on a table, our brain instantly perceives it as something to grasp or pick up. We understand the phone as something for us to manipulate and the motor simulation of our brain is triggered long before we consciously assess that the object is a phone. Similar processing happens when we remember or imagine something. When I remember being in that old house on the farm, I'm not retrieving that memory from some file in my brain. I am literally living the physical aspects of being in the space by firing the same parts of my brain that my body experienced in the place all those years ago. 
Perhaps this is why old places trigger such powerful memories. Our brains are literally reprocessing them. Sarah Robinson, co-editor of Mind and Architecture, Neuroscience, Embodiment, and the Future of Design, spoke at the Driehaus Foundation event movingly and poetically about the role of emotion in architectural experience. She emphasized that often our contemporary spaces are deprived of the qualities that resonate emotionally with people, and that much recent architecture leads to sensory deprivation and the deterioration of people's emotions, even to emotional atrophy and depression. For those of us preservationists who have been fighting the battle against sprawl and soulless development, Sarah's work seems to confirm everything we have known intuitively. Sarah also cited the Spanish steps in Rome shown here as an example of the bodily experience of space, explaining that they were designed to reflect the movements of the human body as it performed the Polonaise, a Baroque dance. This reinforced an idea that Dr. Galese had expressed that from the point of view of brain functioning, imagination, creativity, and memory are linked. Dr. Galese had noted that the process of walking upstairs is stored in our procedural memory. So that when I remember going up the banisterless curving stairway in that old house, my brain is literally recreating the process of going up those stairs. What is the relevance of all of this to historic preservation? While there is much research still to be done, many of the ideas expressed at the symposium seem to support a broader appreciation of older and historic places. As I considered their presentations, I noted that <clears throat> many older buildings, cities, towns, and communities already perform well using the humanistic principles supported by current neuroscience studies. People seek out these old places because they find them satisfying. People navigate by landmarks and our old buildings serve as landmarks. And time and memory are important for placing people on a continuum. When I talk about uh, how people learn history at historic sites, I almost talk about this place shown here, President Lincoln's Cottage, the National Trust historic site in the District of Columbia. People here learn about President Lincoln and the Civil War. I talk about how visitors here learn history with all their senses, and in particular, how they love being able to walk on the floorboards where Lincoln walked during the Civil War, to touch the handrail he used as he walked upstairs. President Lincoln's Cottage performed a study of the visitors' experiences. The report found that powerful experiences in architecture have the ability to transform, affect, or change human understanding. These changes can occur on a metaphysical, sociopolitical, psychological, religious, or pedagogical level. Significantly, historic places and museums that celebrate culture, events, people, art, and artifacts tend to have such remarkable capacity and therefore, not surprisingly, attract people from all walks of life to their doors. President Lincoln's Cottage hopes to further this research with a, an electroencephalogram study. As research about how people perceive and respond to place continues, it may reinforce some preservation ideas and challenge others. Preservationists may be able to use this new information to make the case for historic preservation, but more importantly, we can consciously use our tools to fulfill people's needs more effectively. I'll note that I've also just heard of a pilot program in Massachusetts called Culture RX, where families can be prescribed by a doctor visits to historic sites. A number of these scholars noted the connection between place and imagination. I wrote in the book about how people are inspired by old places to compose, write, and do other creative work. We see here the studio of Daniel Chester French in the uh, right and in the upper left, a National Trust historic site in Chester, uh, called Chesterwood in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. A few years ago, I chaired a panel exploring the connections between creativity and old places with a contemporary sculptor, Judith Shea, and a contemporary composer, Eric Nathan. 
French was the sculptor of the seat at Lincoln at the Lincoln Memorial. And the studio and grounds continue to inspire artists today through sculpture shows and residencies. Why is this the case that old places spur creativity? The urbanist Richard Florida doesn't say why, but he observed the reality that the creative class is drawn to old places. One of the key ingredients of creative places, according to Florida, is authenticity. He says, authenticity, as in real buildings, real people, real history, is key. At the Driehaus Symposium, Dr. Michael Erbib from the Association for Neuroscience in Architecture in San Diego spoke about memory, image, and imagination. He said that when he thinks about architecture, images come to his mind, and when he designs, he frequently finds himself sinking into old, half-forgotten memories. There are striking similarities, he said, between remembering the past and imagining the future. A common brain network underlies both. In one of the only studies that sought to isolate the difference age makes in a community, Jeremy Wells, who now teaches at the University of Maryland, compared a new urbanist development near Charleston called Ion with a comparable area in the historic district of Charleston. Here, here's uh, images from Ion and he tried to match it as closely as possible. Here are the images from Charleston. Professor Wells determined that what age value added was the sense of spontaneous fantasy, essentially that people's imaginations were spurred more by old places than by the new place that matched the old place in terms of design. Why? Not exactly sure, but he, it seemed to have to do with the questions that old places raised in people's minds. Imagination is being spurred at our National Trust historic sites every day with support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Trust African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Nationally acclaimed playwright Aoife Baeza is in the midst of her second commission at the Shadows on the Tash in Louisiana shown here. In 2019, Baeza began a community playwriting workshop with 11 people from Iberia Parish, with participants ranging in age from their teens to their 70s, called Telling the Full History. Um, and this work uh, will tell deeply personal stories of the African American history in the area from slavery through the 20th century. This is an image of a new work at one of our historic sites housed in Lyndhurst uh, in Terrytown, New York, it has an, a ruined swimming pool building. And this artwork titled Watershed Moment is a site-specific art installation combining water sounds and dust that invites visitors to pause and reflect on the memories, both personal, social, and environmental that define each of us. Conceived as a meditative space by artist and preservationist Jorge Otero Paez, the installation includes suspended latex cast of the decaying walls over the dry swimming pool below. Monumental in size, the glowing cast enveloped the bodies of visitors in the sounds of New York State's main water bodies. Otero Paez's art practice deals with memory, culture and transitions, and invites the viewer to consider buildings and functional objects as powerful agents of change. Old places not only inspire creativity, these works of imagination change our own conception of these old places, allowing us to see them in a new light. Last month, Professor Otero Paez introduced the 2021 Fitch Colloquium on the Art of Preservation, which was co-sponsored by the National Trust. He emphasized that although our preservation tools are primarily thought of as objective legal tools, our emotional connections to historic places are central to our understanding of the importance of heritage, and that art has the capacity to reveal the emotional meanings of these places. He said that emotional attachment to heritage is at the core of preservation and that those emotions hold communities together. Fortunately, 
new work is being done around the world to develop the techniques and methodologies for identifying and fostering people's emotional attachments to place. The scholars Rebecca Madgen from the University of Glasgow and James Lesh from the University of Melbourne have edited a book that brings these ideas together. To quote from the publisher, this book advocates a need to shift to a more nuanced understanding of people's relations to historic places by situating emotional attachments at the core of urban heritage thinking and practice. I contributed a concluding chapter to the book and titled it Heart Bombing Heritage based on the trend to heart bomb endangered uh, historic buildings. I noted that while I certainly advocate for the continued preservation of architecturally and historically significant places, the regulatory practices of historic preservation leave uh, many places that people care deeply about unacknowledged and unprotected. As two of the contributors, Stephen Cook and Crystal Buckley noted, when places are missed by these surveys or their recognition is limited to their architectural, aesthetic or historic values, the legal frameworks can fail to reflect community attachment and expectations. Better recognition of the experience of place attachment, including those small details of sensory engagement and the experience of movement are potentially of substantial practical value, they said. In the United States, many scholars and practitioners alike have noted the limitations of the current tools and practices, specifically the designation of sites of significance to underrepresented communities, such as African-Americans, LGBTQ people, and others, has often been hampered because these sites did not meet the criteria for architectural or historic significance, or they were not perceived to meet those criteria, um, or because they did not meet the standard for integrity, the ability of the place to convey its significance through its existing physical features. At the same time, Many of these places were often of deep emotional importance to the people who were historically associated with them. Emotional attachment seems to be at the heart of why old places matter to people, as noted by my opening comments about continuity, memory, and identity. In May last year, I wrote an essay titled Sheltering in Place about the experience of being at home during the coronavirus shutdown. How long ago May seems now and how much the world has changed since then. I wrote then about the way in response to loss or threat, our homes and the familiar places of our lives can give us comfort, solace and a sense of security. And that this, this applies to our historic places, whether our homes, our neighborhoods, main streets, or historic sites. I referenced an essay titled The Great Empty by Michael Kimmelman, who wrote about places that are usually teeming with people like Times Square in New York or the Spanish Steps in Rome, but were vacant. Kimmelman acknowledges the feeling of beauty that comes from the absence, a sense of the sublime, akin to the feelings inspired by ruins, but Kimmelman also wrote that these empty places remind us that beauty requires human interaction. It brought home to me that it is people who give places meaning, that turn spaces into places, as the cultural geographers say, and that turn buildings and landscapes into heritage. One of the key themes of the symposium in Edinburgh that I missed because of COVID was that heritage, historic preservation, is not static, not frozen in some specific time, not fixed forever in a statement of significance, but is a process. Historic preservation is about the way we ascribe meaning to historic places and is therefore ever changing. Heritage is not the buildings or landscapes, it is the meanings we give the buildings and landscapes. One additional thought about emotional attachments to place and how the places have the capacity to change us as well as support us. In the book, I wrote about how old places are beautiful. 
if you Google beautiful places, you'll come up with a list of natural places and old places with only a smattering of new buildings. Beauty and the threat to beautiful places was the driving force for many early preservation efforts. And beauty remains at the heart of why old places care about old places. We all know how much harder it is to save an ugly building than it is to save a beautiful building. Yet as I talked to people about beauty as a reason, I found that people were reticent to talk about it. Again, this is for many reasons, the perceived subjective nature of beauty, the difficulty of defining it, the loaded cultural aspects of beauty, or the fact that it may be considered frivolous or expendable. I was dismayed when the previous presidential administration issued the executive order on promoting beautiful federal civic architecture. And the National Trust issued a strong statement condemning the order as inconsistent with the values of historic preservation. Beauty can be found in brutalist buildings like the Salk Institute shown in the lower right, as well as in the graffiti covered concrete of Miami Marine Stadium shown in the center, as well as the columned and acknowledged beauty of the other places shown in the slide. I'm pleased that the Biden administration has revoked this executive order. Yet beauty, wherever it is found, is still something that delights, moves, and satisfies people. A study by the British Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment found that beauty is a deeply positive experience contributing to happiness and well being. As some of you know, I wrote an essay about why the Cathedral of Notre Dame matters. Like people all over the world, I was brought to tears by the sight of flame shooting from the Cathedral of Notre Dame. As the spire collapsed, I feared that Notre Dame, a place treasured the world over, was gone forever. When Parisians spontaneously sang hymns on the streets, I shared their sense of visceral shock and loss. And when images of the interior emerged the next day, I felt a deep sense of relief at the miraculous sight of intact blue and red stained glass and votive candles still flickering in their red glass holders. During and after this catastrophe, countless others confided on social media that they too felt such a profound sense of loss and yes, even mourning over Notre Dame, this beautiful place. We felt this loss because we recognize these places do something few other things can. They remind us that we are all part of humanity and the world. They expand our notion of ourselves beyond our treasured individual memories and national identity to give us an expansive sense of shared humanity across the globe. One of the very thoughtful comments on the National Trust Facebook page in response to the essay described how torn the commenter felt about all the funding that materialized almost instantly in the larger context of homelessness, a lack of medical care, a lack of food security, and refugee crises and conflict. I responded that I didn't think it was an either or choice, that I also supported housing security, universal health care, and food security. Yet I also emphasize the way this old place seemed to bring people together so that we could sense our shared humanity. I referred to the book On Beauty and Being Just by Elaine Scarry, which suggests that the experience of beauty has the capacity to help people be more empathetic and to open their hearts to all of humanity. Nancy Perkins Spike, published a law review article discussing aesthetic regulation and the relationship to justice. She said that the preservation and protection of beautiful vistas and culturally significant structures is important, not merely because they're part of the environment or because they enrich us or because they might otherwise be lost forever. By preserving their beauty, the law additionally um, keeps them accessible to observers whose experience will feed their sense of justice and perhaps prepare them for just acts towards others. The National Trust is working to tell the full American story as a part of our work, including through the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. 
The building on the left is Robert's Temple in Chicago, Illinois, where Emmett Till's funeral was held. And on the right is the National Negro Company Opera House in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The National Trust listed these on our 11 most endangered historic places list. We're also working to preserve key places at historically black colleges and universities, including in Atlanta at Spelman. Identifying, recognizing, and preserving the places of African-American achievement and struggle provide that deep sense of identity, memory, and belonging that is furthering racial and social justice and is ultimately essential to well-being. Like the many reasons that old places matter to people, these ideas are interconnected. The sense of belonging, memory, creativity, imagination, beauty, and social justice. Increasingly, the preservation field sees these multi-layered connections, all of which are about our well-being and the well-being of others. In late 2019, I was in India for a series of book talks about why old places matter. In Delhi, I met with the representatives of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture to tour several projects they were working on in the neighborhoods around Humayun's tomb, shown here. Their projects are not just about the buildings or sites. They are about the broader purposes preserving these sites can serve. The website states, the notion of culture as an asset rather than a luxury is still a contested issue in many poorer parts of the world. The central question has been how culture integrated with more traditional instruments of development can be used to improve lives in urban, poor, and even remote contexts. How can culture provide employment, raise incomes, affect well-being, improve health, enhance urban spaces, reinforce a respect for diversity, even restore pride and hope. At the site I visited in Delhi, shown here, the people said that they had been ashamed of where they were from, but because of the work of the Aga Khan Trust, they began to think of their home differently as something to be proud of, a place that gave them a sense of belonging and pride. It seems to me that this is the work of preservation and the National Trust to help provide people with a sense of belonging that is essential for their psychological and emotional health, to give them the opportunity to experience beauty that opens their hearts and minds to empathy with others, to recognize and act on the role preservation can play in creating a more just and equitable world and help them experience these places in a way that they can imagine a better future. Thank you. It's been a delight to speak with you all today. And I'll be delighted if we have time for some questions. <laughs>